Hello. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you. Welcome to Steel Case. Now, if you don't know who Steel Case is, Steel Case is we are where you are in this lovely uh, work life center in London. Um, we are the, a global leader in furniture manufacturing. And um, it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Um, my name's Libby Fair, and I lead our global events and experiences for Steelcase. And if you get a chance to go anywhere in the world, we are where you are. Um, we are big believers in the power of place, and we are so excited to have you in our place this evening. So thank you for coming. Um, tonight is our kickoff with the Atlantic's relationship with um, this wonderful Atlantic Exchange conversation. And we are also... Uh, big believers in the topic of this evening um, with people uh, inspired and driven, purpose-driven organizations. We feel like we are, and we know that you are passionate about the conversation as well. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Steve Clemens, who is the editor-at-large for The Atlantic Live and Washington, D.C. Atlantic. Am I correct in saying? Do I have it? Pretty Do darn I good? close. Yeah, I would, and, I, I would have added London editor-at-large. And, and London Paris and... and uh, Everything else. So he is the man of the evening, along with the man next yeah. to him, and I'm going to let you take it over from here. Thank so you, thank you. Thank Enjoy you, your Lord. evening. Lord Levy, come join, join me up there. Hey, everybody. Good to see all of you. Lord Levy, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I hope the wine keeps flowing. I hear we've got a reception before, reception after. And so many of you are people that I've known uh, a number of years. Some of you I want to know for many more years after this is over. And I want to just say a few words about Lord Michael Levy. Lord. Levy, as you, many of you here in Britain know, uh, essentially is, is, is one of the men credited, or the man credited with saving the Labor Party here. Uh, but more importantly, he is the president of four, what I would call purpose-driven organizations here uh, in the UK, Volunteering Matters, uh, formerly known as Community Service Volunteers, the largest network of, of, of volunteering and volunteers in the UK, uh, Jewish Care, Jewish Free School and the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade. Um, he is someone that I have uh, only encountered one other time in, in, in form, and it was at his son's wedding. Uh, and Daniel Levy, who is here, I want to point out Daniel, is really, when you talk about a purpose-driven organization, he is it. Uh, there is no one that I know who is a better person who has committed himself to doing great things in the world and figuring out how to move the needle on something. And I was uh, the co-founder of the New America Foundation, America Foundation in Washington, D.C., uh, Daniel came over and spent some time with us and it was one of the greatest privileges uh, that we had working with him and seeing how he operated uh, out of area, we can say. Uh, and and uh, uh, I've decided to drop Lord Levy and just call Lord Levy Godfather. Uh, it kind of feels better. Uh, Godfather, it's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do any service, no. Uh, that's streaming live. I'm editorially in trouble right now. Um, but it's, it's great to be with you. So I, I thought what we would do here uh, is, is talk a little bit about something that Lord Levy, when we were talking about, called ambition with, pa ambition with passion, right? Is ambition? Compassion. I'm sorry? With compassion. Compassion. Ambition with compassion. Yeah. Yes, ambition with passion would be close to Nixon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Daniel Levy's frets about this because I did open the Nixon Center in Washington. So I am the ruthless part of the evening. But let me just start there for a minute. We're talking, you know, in the, there is a rise um, in for-profit organizations, in non-profit organizations, in NGOs, in individuals, a sense that purpose matters. And in my old world of, of being a Nixonian realist, that sounds to me uh, uh, amorphous, and I, and I sometimes don't get it, but there is this this movement where organizations are inspiring people to do something more. We hear that millennials really don't want to have full-time jobs. They want to work part-time and they want to go commit themselves. And I'm wondering in the many organizations that you've helped fund and run, whether you've noticed this change uh, yourself. Steve, well, thank you for the introduction. I'm always pleased that my son gets a better intro than me. I'm very, I'm very, I'm very proud of that. Long may that continue. Um, let me just perhaps tell the audience how ambition and compassion started. Um, Blair in those days was humble, believe it or not. <laughs> Obviously you don't believe it, but he was. He had just become the leader of the Labour Party and I remember it like now, we're at my home, we're doing lengths down the pool. 
and he said, come on, smart ass, what's going to be the theme for the election? I did a couple more lengths, and I turned, and I said, I tell you, Tony, the Labour Party has always had compassion and felt for people, but it's never given people the real drive and ambition. The Tories have always had drive and ambition, but somehow they've lost their compassion. Mm. How about ambition with compassion? And did he strike? I remember he suddenly yeah. stopped. In the water. I won't use the vocabulary uh. he used. Uh. And he said, that's it. And that became the theme. And then it became compassionate conservatism, and the words have been twisted around. But I suppose what's driven me in going back to what you've said about organisation, Steve, is, um, you know, I wasn't from a hole in the ground, but up until nine, we didn't have a bathroom. We used to have to go, well, I went with my family at a public bath. Mm. We lived in one room. And somehow, circumstances, whatever, right time at the right place in professional life to the entertainment industry, I was fortunate. And I always felt that the greatest gift we have is to contribute in some way to society. No matter what that is, it doesn't, that is, it doesn't need to be financial, it can be energy, it can be time, it can be a, an ability to persuade others to do what they do. But I feel that every one of us has got something to give back in some way. That has always been my inspiration. Was there a moment, an inflection point in your life, because there is out there, because I did my research, one of the things I didn't mention uh, about you, it's just so interesting because you're, you, you have succeeded in so many different realms, and one of them is in entertainment uh, and music businesses, which you built and sold twice. And one story was that your mother said, Michael, it's time for you to make a difference. It's time for you to make a switch when she was in the, in the, in the latter days of her life. And it's a very moving uh, passage, if, if, if what is true. So what was the inflection point there that took you from yeah. you know, entertainment and money, which can, which can be purposeful in some ways, but, but to making such a big difference in, in the political and the, and the philanthropic realms? What you say, Steve, is absolutely right. Um, my late mom, I'm an only child. My dad had died many years before. She had an amputation. And then she and I sat with her many days, many weeks, day after day. We obviously couldn't talk, but I just felt she was giving this message, Michael, change your life. I was 43 at the time, had a really successful business. We were actually bigger than Virgin at that time. And after she passed away and I had the 30-day period of mourning, I phoned my lawyer who was on my board and said, I want to have a private dinner with you. And I just said, I want out. I want to sell. He looked to me like I was nuts, did all he could to persuade me not to sell, gave me so many good reasons, and one particular reason that I decided to go deaf on because it was so sensible why I shouldn't sell, but I just didn't want to sell. And within a matter of weeks, all the big boys wanted to buy had sold to Warner Brothers. Mm. And that's when life... I was very involved in charity, but that's when life changed, then got involved in the political arena and expanded my activities, Steve, within the charitable world. Now, perhaps I could have been, could have been mega, mega today. However, I feel what I've been able to contribute has been much more important, in my life anyway, than being mega, mega. Um, and that was the turning point, just when my late mum was unable to speak to me, but somehow gave me this message. She made a huge switch. A, a very big switch um, from basically then devoting my life entirely to charity and then a young man called Blair and helping him win three elections. So it was a dramatic switch in life and in lifestyle, yes. So one of the things that I mentioned is you, you, we all meet or run into people who seem bigger than life, who... Uh, are able to walk and, and move the needle, but it requires uh, an ability to change the way other people think about themselves. And 
you know, they talk about you uh, as being the best fundraiser in England and being one of the most successful fundraisers, not only politically, but in philanthropies and others. So money is a piece of it always, but I, I'm interested in, in the human dimension of inspiring people, and particularly in the volunteering organization that you do. What, what do you think is, is, is required to change them a little bit selfless and not, not as selfish with their interests? You know, I'm going to do something slightly different with your permission. Mm. There's the head of fundraising at one of the largest charities in the country, which I'm president of. I'm going to put him on the spot. Ooh. Daniel, <laughs> why, don't, why don't you answer that question? Yeah. There we are. I'm putting you right on the spot. Hi, Daniel. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Come over here. Yeah. I'm putting you right on the spot. But this is one of my tricks. Because you can answer it better this than me. This is one of my tricks. Mm. The funny yeah. thing is, I predicted yeah. <laughs> I said to my colleagues that Michael will do exactly that um, because he is so humble. And I think. Uh, well, and I've witnessed Michael be the best fundraiser in the country on many occasions. And I think what's so special is his ability to develop a relationship with people, with people on all sorts of levels. And I've watched him in operation. And people develop a huge admiration and respect for Michael. And on the back of that, his ability to transform people's giving from what may have been you know, a, a reasonably generous level to but transform... Tell us, to transform tell us the real story. Transformative I mean, gifts. I, he, he, he breaks through the stuffiness of people, right? Yes. How does he do that? He did it with me yesterday. It freaked <laughs> me out. The best schmoozer in the world. There's no question about yeah. it. Absolutely no question yeah. about it. I mean... It, you know, I've, I've seen the arm round the neck and <laughs> the cuddles and the kisses. Um, but at the heart of it is something much more meaningful. Than I called that, I him yesterday and, he, and he, I thought he was three or four different people because he used three or four different accents. I actually thought it was Daniel. Uh, <laughs> and then I said something in confidence to Daniel about his dad that I hoped his dad wouldn't hear and it was Michael all along. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, anyway, that, I, I, I got a sense of how he breaks through. Is that, is that what he does? Absolutely. And, I th and, he, and also in a very quick period of time as well, and there are people that Michael's met in the last couple of years, certainly for Jewish care, that have developed a very special bond and relationship with Michael. And, you know, and the result of the relationship developing into people's philanthropic giving and their relationship with a charity is very substantial. And, and there's very few people that can do that in such a small amount of time as well. So I think, you know, I, I've seen it in action. There is no one better than Michael. So let well, me ask you... A, a, thank you. I didn't yeah. quite expect yeah, I should have had you words, but I, there you go. Yeah, I should have had you. It would have gone better. Dan, Daniel, thank you very much. Let, let me just say, you know, people who've had success in life really want to be able to give back, but often they don't know how to do it. Hmm. And they need to be unlocked. They need to be made to feel why they should do something, how they should do something. And it's a matter of turning the key. And as Daniel has, has just said, you don't always win, by the way. But more often than not, one can win because people do want to feel good about themselves, mm. but often they just don't know how to go about it. And they need to be helped. They don't need to feel bullied. They need to feel helped and, and to show who they are and what they are and what they stand for. And often they, they just don't know how to do it and they just need that help. And if you can, and if you can do that to them, it's quite amazing, I mean, what can happen? You know, one of the things, in, in this room tonight, uh, I've looked through the list, it's an, an amazing array of people who are engaged in a whole variety of different uh, um, positive social good organizations, international organizations. Some are lawyers and bankers and others that are, that are, that are pushing the needle in various ways. And one of my friendly and very friendly criticisms of, of what I would call the social justice community or the global good community is that they can't organize themselves out of a hat. That, that the, the lot of heart, lot of sentiment, lot of good feeling, wanting to change the world, jumping in, but they don't understand a playbook. And many times to make progress, you've got to make hard choices, that, that hard choices require you
prioritize. They think of it. Richard Holbrook, um, who I can say was a friend of mine, someone I admired. I found, I wrote a piece once on Richard. Uh, for many of you uh, uh, here in the UK, Richard was uh, a mover and shaker in international affairs in, in the United States. He died uh, a few years ago. And, and he was one of the most ruthless progressive Democrats. I have mostly and tenaciously committed to results, which he achieved in Bosnia. Uh, he was trying to do that in Afghanistan. Uh, in a very, but he had a progressive mindset, but he knew that there were hard choices were part of it. And I'm interested in whether that kind of map is something that you think has to be brought to a Labour Party or to a volunteering organisation. Well, let's focus on volunteering organisations because I think there's much more hope there than there is in the Labour Party today. I was just going about they were saying. Um, yeah, do you want do you want to save the, do you want to save the Labour Party again? Uh, well, you know, I'm a few years older uh, now, and. Um, I think they're doing a great job of destroying themselves and anyone who wants to try and help them, somehow they're going deaf, dumb and blind on them. So it's it, we call it, it tweet tragedy because <laughs> we, we really do need a good opposition and a party that can get back into mm. power, but perhaps there may be some questions on that. In terms of volunteering organisations, Steve, the most important thing is what is the product? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why does a charity do what it does? Is it in volunteering? Is it in, is it in care? Is it in youth work? Is it in education? What is its modus vivendi? What is its purpose? Is that a purpose that is going to appeal to people? But more importantly, is it something that society needs? If the answer to that is yes, you know you're in the game. Mm. When you know the answer to that is yes, then how do you get that message over? How do you expand that message? How do you build the charity? How do you expand the service you're giving? You must absolutely have transparency, accountability, and a board of trustees that really understand that. So there can never be any question marks about where the charity is going or what it does. And then it's really about getting the message, getting people turned on, having a top professional staff, having them trained properly so they know what they're doing, and then really just going for it in helping to build that charity. There are those who want to get involved, and there are those who just want to write out checks. They both count. It's many ingredients and one just needs to get the mix of the ingredients right. But when I made my maiden speech, if it's honesty time, my only speech in the House of Lords, because I really don't bother to speak there very often for a number of reasons, it was about... It's probably good to give one great speech rather than many lousy speeches. Well, I think it was a good speech. Great may be an exaggeration, Steve. But it was about the working together of the public sector the voluntary sector mm. and the business sector. That is so terribly important. The public sector often feel they know it all. The business sector feel it's just about how much their bottom line is. And the voluntary sector sometimes is so inward looking that they're not really reaching out where they should. The combination of those three sectors is to me what is going to make our society all over the world so much better. And it's something I see from the work you're doing, Steve, and with Atlantic and the various sessions that you run around the world. I, I'm using my, vocab my vocabulary, mm -hmm. but I guess it's the sort of thing that you believe in and what you're trying to do. And to oh, achieve. very much. I, mean, I, I should mention uh, The Atlantic, uh, which is one of America's oldest magazines. We were founded in 1857. We're actually the third oldest magazine, I think Town and Country and Scientific American barely beat us. But we were founded by abolitionists. It's one of these interesting things that there was always a progressive uh, bit of DNA in, in what we're about. Um, and I think when you kind of look at that broad thing, it's, it's made me think frequently whether it was working you know, with Daniel and, and what he's been trying to do in the Middle East or looking at you know, how you, it's very hard to change the vector of people. It's very hard to change the vector of nations. 
uh, and you've done that. Is there a Unilever guy in here somewhere? Where's, who's from Unilever? I thought we had somebody from Unilever. Well, I'm going to blow that. Paul Pullman, uh, who's the CEO of Unilever, is someone I interviewed uh, last year, and he has uh, taken a company and, and, and made it both about business and about sustainability. Uh, and, and for those of you, I mean, Unilever is a huge, huge firm. Uh, and I ask him, you know, when he changes, he dropped quarterly guidance in the advice, that, in the advice that, you know, in the, in the uh, you know, giving the uh, investment crowd, uh, stopped giving quarterly comments. And he says, they couldn't fire me on the day they hired me. So he changed it that day <laughs> uh, and went on. And he's now, I think, you know, uh, uh, showing how to change the entire business that he runs, the, the supply chains he's running for that. Um, and where's um, Greg Rose from, from Virgin Land? Um, Greg, there's Greg over here. Greg, stand up for a minute, because Greg works with Richard Branson, and he's head of content and social media. And Greg, I was going to invite you to offer a provocation yourself on how you guys are approaching changing a company, because what, what Lord Levy just said here a moment ago is that the corporate sector, you need partnership, but the corporate sector is usually about the bottom line. But as I think about today, I'm seeing more and more CEOs world basically changing that tune yeah well um, I guess it kind of echoes what you were just saying it's around Richard just tends to think around entrepreneurial solutions of what's going to be the right way to get to the point that he wants to get to and if that means cutting through so it's not just about the business bottom line then that's the way that it will go um, and the main thing for that is finding the right partners so rather than it just rather than it just all being about how much money a virgin company is going to make it's about how much you know, how much impact it can have, how much positive difference it can have. And if that means bringing in a third party, if that means creating a non-branded thing, such as The Elders, which works on conflict resolution, Carbon War Room, which works on climate change, then then Richard will try and do that and try and work in you know, a space that you wouldn't expect him to go in if it's going to have the most positive impact. So I think that's the main thing. So it's not just thinking about what's the product that a business is going to make, it's thinking about the impact that that product's going to have and the people it's going to affect. Or Levy, do you see, how do you react to that? Yeah, I, look, that's incredibly commendable. I mean, I've been to some events um, with the elders. Um, do you mind if I amplify on what the elders um, is? I mean, the elders are... It's a shadowy group, right? <laughs> elder, elder statesmen. <laughs> um, Former who, president of Brazil, form, Kofi Annan, yeah, Jimmy Carter. Yeah, yeah, look. Um, power crowd. Power. Yeah. Um, who would like to think they're still running the world, Steve? <laughs> um, and perhaps in their mind, they still are running the world. Ambition with compassion. And when they get, to, when they get together, um, I'm sure that um, the sort of people they have around them, and as you just heard, Richard is one of the people that backs my own a number of others who back them. And I think, Daniel, you speak to um, the elders on the Middle East whenever they get together. Um, and I have absolutely only praise for people like that who get together, inspire others, because although they may not be running mm. the world, they may not have the power base that they had, should they therefore be put on some sort of rubbish heap? I think not. And if they can make a contribution and they're prepared to give their time and energy and use their experience and motivate business leaders, a la Richard, in doing that, that has to be a good thing, Steve. I want to change subjects a little bit. Recently, I mean, I've been so impressed with what you've been doing with various Jewish groups, elder group, uh, youth, uh, those that... Um, uh, have a strong feeling or should have a strong feeling about Judaism in the U UK. I've just been in Paris um, and, and have been all around France in which there's just no doubt that the, the, the picture there of b the inability thus far of a, of a government or the struggle with a government to amalgamate different cultures. And I went to a, to a, a essentially a, a, a Arabic Muslim market in, 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 and talked to quite a number of people, went to uh, the Jewish area in Paris, they're having problems.
And I'm interested in what insights you have when it comes to philanthropy, when it comes to moving the needle, when it comes to creating not only inclusiveness and support within a community, but connecting that community into broader mainstream society. What insights you have about that? Because I think, you know, if you read one of our cover stories in the Atlantic recently, Goldberg saying the Jews should leave Europe essentially, or is it time for the Jews to leave Europe? And I'm interested in what you think, what your lessons are from your experience uh, in that. Well, let me absolutely answer that to say, no, I don't think it's the time for Jews to leave Europe, and I hope it is never going to be the time, time for Jews to leave Europe, or for that matter, any other part of the world they're in. That applies to Muslims, that applies to any other faith. As far as I'm concerned, there should never be a time that a minority, religious, ethnic community should leave any country or any society. And if they would have to, it's not just an indictment on that country, it's frankly an indictment on all of us in the world today. So let me answer that and all these um, scaremongering that Jews should leave Europe, frankly, I, I couldn't disagree with more, Steve. Is there anti-Semitism? Sure. Is there anti-black? Is there anti-gay? Is there anti-any movement? Any part of society? Yes. That's the world we live in. But it's those who are anti and are negative that we need to feel sorry for. As far as I'm concerned, when I was envoy of the Prime Minister for the Middle East and was going around the Arab world, meeting with Assad Senior continually, Arafat, did I get criticised? Did I have anti-Semitic stuff thrown at me? Did I have to have security? Yes. So what? It goes with the package. Mm -hmm. Did I wake up every day and open the closet and say, wow, is there an anti-Semite in the closet? No. Absolutely not. As far as I was concerned, I was born in this country. This country's been great to me. And yeah, did I as a 10, 11 year old have a bundle because someone would call, say, Jew boy and I would get out there and we would beat the shit out of each other? Yeah, so what? That's part of growing up, that's part of life. Um, have there been some horrible incidents, what happened in Paris, what just happened in Copenhagen? Yeah, absolutely. But does that mean that Jews have got to pack up their bags? Does it mean Netanyahu has been right? The only safe place for Jews is Israel? I don't believe that. I really don't believe that, Steve. So, yes. let, me, so let me absolutely start on that premise. And do I believe that all forms of society should work together? Absolutely. And that's why I take roles very much in the wider society. I take roles within it, roles within my own community because I feel I have an obligation to my community and a responsibility to my community. But I take roles in the wider society because likewise I feel I have, that I have a responsibility to the wider society. You have, and I know this from talking uh, to, to folks here in this country that I, in my research about your work uh, and in my knowledge what you've done, what's interesting about Jewish Care, uh, Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade, is, is you, and, and, and particularly the volunteering matters, is that you create communities of support and connect them to other communities. So Absolutely. they're not isolated. I, I don't know if that, you know, when we talk about purpose-driven activities and purpose-driven organizations, whether that is, you know, as a mind of the importance of connecting these different crowds and not just zeroing in on one faction. Well, we, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., we have sorry, these sorry. problems, I think, as well. Well, we're, we're trying to make, for instance, in care or in JLGB, hmm. Jewish Lands and Girls Brigade, in other words, in care for the elderly, in care for Alzheimer's, in care for dementia, in looking after youth, hmm. working hmm. with other parts of society, a unit for Alzheimer's hmm. within Jewish care hmm. to help the outside society the rest of society, wider society. We do youth work within JLGB that helps the wider society. Mm. In volunteering matters, we do work for youngsters, we do work with those who've been in prison, who need to be rehabilitated back in society. 
We have a program for those who are retired, have time on their hands so they can give back of their time and energy. They just need to be directed to do it. We try and create centers of excellence, mm -hmm. not just for that organization, but that are going to be role models for the rest of society. And that's something, Steve, that I believe in. This country is, of course, way smaller than um, in, in terms of our population, in terms of size geographically. Um, and therefore, I, I, I believe it's probably much easier to aspire to be able to do that here in the UK than it would be in the States. Well, it's fascinating to see, and I think it's an important part of this purpose-driven map uh, to discuss it. Where's Heather Hamilton? Heather, Heather, let's run her a mic. Heather, Heather, is, Heather, Heather is a friend of mine from Washington who's pretending to be a Brit now. <laughs> uh, lives here. Hardly. So yeah, Heather, Heather, give us your provocation on the purpose-driven side of things. Well, I think it's it's really interesting. Uh, since I've moved to the UK, the language around the charity um, I think is quite telling, but it reflects the way that we think about the role of nonprofit organizations in society. We think that they are there to give out charity. So I'd be interested in hearing how you perceive your role as a provocateur yourself and fundraiser around broader social change. I work for Girls Not Brides, which was a project of the elders. Um, and I didn't know that, that this was not a stacked deck for the elders, just by the way. I know, really. I just like Heather. <laughs> you know. Thanks, Steve. You know, we're looking to make long-term social change in ending child marriage. And sometimes for those really sticky issues, be it discrimination or human rights, it's very hard, it, it's, it's quite easy to say to someone, hey, we're going to give handouts or we're going to actually have this direct impact on individuals' lives as a charity. But how do you actually take people on the line of thinking towards a broad movement? Okay, that's a very interesting um, question, if I may, Please. Steve. Um, I hate to look upon charities, Heather, as giving handouts to people. I prefer to see a charity as a voluntary body that is embracing people's needs. And all the charities that I'm involved with, I never see them as organizations giving handouts. I see it as much more dealing with social needs, demographic needs, dealing with needs of different segments of society, whether in the elderly, whether in youth work, whether putting volunteers into organizations, whether embracing youngsters who are going off the scale and therefore need to be brought back onto, onto the map in a proper way. But I don't see them as give out charities. I, I, I actually don't like that connotation at all. I see it as much more embracing parts of society and people in, society, people in society who want that help, need that help, but when you give them the help, you don't feel they forever have got to be grateful to the organization that they've given them the help. So that's the best way I can answer you. And that really you know, leads on to call it what you will, social justice, just purpose in society. Organizations should be there to embrace and to deal with issues, not to make people feel that they're getting a handout. That I think is, is not certainly where my philosophy has ever been. Where is Tim Hildebrandt? I didn't, you guys weren't, we were supposed to sit in different parts of the room, damn it. Uh, Tim, Tim is... Uh, There's a Tim, seat over here, yeah, Tim. Yeah, Why don't you yeah, come yeah. in the middle? So everybody, this is Tim Hildebrand. Uh, Tim's here. a really smart guy uh, here. You're, you're at LSE? Tim? Yeah. No one yeah. can see okay, you. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tim, Tim's an Asianist, <laughs> where, uh, but did a lot of work on LGBT issues right in right China. Okay. You just fine. stand there and... Yeah, Great. There, this oh, this is much And we're going to get to everybody in the room. Uh, over a lot of drinks later, but questions. But I asked Tim, who worked on LGBT issues in China, mm. uh, and is a scholar studying sort of 
organizations that move. And so this is, I want to, I, I don't know where you're going to go with I'm this. Not but gonna, yeah. I'm not going to go no. exactly where you think I'm going to okay, go. go. I'm yeah. going to prov provoke. Okay. Um, so I'm a political economist at the, Sorry, you a political economist. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in the role of politics and economics, specifically as it pertains to non-governmental organizations and social enterprises. These things that you call purpose-driven organizations, which by, the, which by the way is a great term and I'll probably use it and I'll cite you, don't worry. You'll get I want credit. You to reference this meeting will Ab be on YouTube Ooh, and uh, <laughs> link it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, so a, a, a couple of things to, to sort of bring up here. Um, I look at NGOs in a lot of different political contexts. Um, you might remember uh, our prime minister, uh, not mine, I guess, but your prime minister has quite famously, infamously talked about the big society. This was thought to be sort of a, a political invitation for nonprofit organizations to play a role in providing social services in the UK. This was Cameron. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, some people thought this meant sort of an erosion of the welfare state. Other people thought that this was an ingenious way to save a lot of money. Uh, what most people don't know is that that term was used quite famously to some people uh, by um, the Chinese government 10 years before when they talked about uh, small state, big society. The point here is that there's this idea of broadening the space for social organizations around the world. Um, and so it transcends political uh, regimes. But probably more interesting that I want to sort of probe you on is the role of economics, the role of money. Um, there are a lot of uh, non-profit non organizations, both in the UK and in places like China, that no longer have the resources that they once had that gave birth to their organizations. Um, and so there is quite a bit of discomfort about uh, bringing in for-profit uh, You've talked a lot about purpose-driven as, as an ends-based organization. But how can we reconcile as organizations ch changing from being a nonprofit to a for-profit and still maintain that focus on societal good in the end? Well, may I? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, first of all, um, big society was basically an expression. It was a typical political statement, had no base, it fell apart because it wasn't thought through properly. That's not because Cameron said it, Blair did things like that, politicians do things like that, it's part of their armory, sadly. And it fell apart because it wasn't thought through in any way that it could have a meaningful result and a meaningful end. I absolutely would support organizations that run for profit but are trying to change society for the good and help society. I don't think there is anything wrong with that at all. I really don't. As long as they do what's written on the tin. As long as they're delivering what they set out to deliver, what they plan to deliver, and don't try and sell something in order to make a profit that is not the reality of what they're setting out to do. I have absolutely no argument with that at all. None at all. And Virtually every major corporation does have its voluntary part, its department that is helping society, the charities they support. And if part of each of these, may, I'm talking about the real major corporations, have elements that they actually run programs, either to break even or to make a profit, that are going to help society as well as what they're giving away, then I would absolutely endorse that, support that. I'm fascinated to know what's going to happen with what Gates created and how he's attracted Buffett and how he's attracted other, not multi-millionaires, but multi-billionaires as to where this pool of money is going to, is going to end up. Because that's going to be one of the largest 
pools of funding that is entering the philanthropic arena? Where is it going to go? How is it really going to be used to change things in society for the better? Is it going to be very narrowly focused? Is it going to be more widely focused? Is it just going to be a pet arena of a particular donor? And I think that that is going to be one of the fascinating areas that we will need to follow in philanthropy over this next period of time. I hope I've covered your points because there were some thought-provoking issues that you raised. Let me just, before I open to, to the uh, entire room, uh, switch one more time uh, and, and go into the arena of statecraft because you did play uh, this, this role as an envoy uh, to the Middle East and you've produced a son, uh, if I can uh, politely say, is monomaniacally obsessed with uh, creating Middle East. And, and I don't say that humorously, he genuinely is uh, extraordinarily talented, uh, he's been at each of the iteration points that I have seen over many years in, in the Israel-Palestine effort and the broader Middle East area. Daniel, uh, I don't think, has, in, in my book, has ever called it wrong. But in the process of that, it's when I think about purpose-driven organizations, I think about you know, purpose in international affairs, which is an area of concern that I have. Right now, um, we have, uh, uh, at least in the U.S., and the U.K. is party to it, the U.K. Is, seems to be more enthusiastic about the Iran deal than, than is currently the case in Washington. Where's Shervin? Uh, Shervin, I always screw up your last name. Makizadeh? Mazikadeh. Z before K or K before Z? Uh, K before Z. But never after E. Never after Yeah, okay. So, uh, Shervin, I just want to highlight for a moment, was one of the great heroes writing and reporting on the Green Revolution out of Iran. Uh, he began writing anonymously. Uh, what did we call you? What was your name? Shane M. Shane M. On, on the Washington Note, my blog. Uh, and it was one of the first time that National Public Radio in the United States and the New York Times allowed someone anonymously without their name to begin, publi to begin publishing. It became a huge hit in the New York Times, writing about the changes, the tectonics of that unusual moment in Iran's history. But, but what, I, what I, I, I wanted to highlight you for a reason, because you had a purpose behind what you were trying to highlight. You were, you were writing in real time about the horrors and the, and the dangers you saw. But I want to ask, before, before I ask you to say anything, uh, Lord Levy, to talk a little bit, you know, in his role as envoy, if you were a uh, 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 foreign minister today, if you did have a powerful magic wand to, to redesign some things that, were, that would take us into a better place, uh, in foreign policy, because things seem to be melting down all around the world, and I'm interested in in, in your take on the international uh, conundrum right now. For ten years, I got beaten up as supposed to be a foreign secretary. So, and please, that doesn't apply anymore. Steve, I I truly believe that. The world is in an extraordinarily difficult moment in history at this m where we are today are today. The rift between Russia and the states is widening. Mm -hmm. The Iran deal, instead of it being allowed to play itself out and to be given an opportunity to work is being castigated in many circles. I don't know what the alternative to this plan can be. And I absolutely believe it's the right thing to pursue. There may be those in the audience who would disagree okay, so with it, that. That's another tweetable moment. But that is what I really believe. I believe that peace today is a real mess. You have Egypt, the largest population of over 90 million. We've seen what's happened to Mamaruk and the Brotherhood with Morsi, now Sisi, trying to make some sense of what's going on there. We have.
We have the Israel-Palestinian situation, which is further away than I feel it ever has been in terms of coming to anything that is remotely going to resemble a plan to move forward with peace. You have Jordan that's gone from a population of about three and a bit million to probably 11 or 12 million today. First of all, the Iraq refugees coming in, now the Syria refugees coming in. Syria, a complete mess, spills into Lebanon on its border. You have the Gulf, which has turned the world on its head. Qatar. I went there in nine for the Prime Minister. Perhaps a hundred odd thousand indigenous Qataris, a population of not even a million. If you ask an audience how many are in Qatar, they'd probably tell you 20, 30 million. Doha, one of the centers of the world, they're going to have the World Cup. I mean, what is it? Is it LNG and oil, mainly LNG, sorry, liquid gas. If you take what the Gulf controls in corporate ownership, whether it be in Europe, whether it be in the States, it is staggering. The transformation of wealth, Saudi, the lifestyle, Kuwait, Qatar I've mentioned, Bahrain much smaller, Oman, what happens there when Qaboos passes on with no one to hand over to, and of course UAE with unbelievable wealth. You go to North Africa, yeah, turmoil. Algeria, a mess. Tunisia, tragic. Morocco, a semblance of sanity. But where does that go to? Iraq, look what's going on. Iran, we have just mentioned. It is very, it is very, very wide. China, with its economic growth, and now a collapse in the market. Where does that lead? India, trying to find its feet. Pakistan, with nuclear capacity, right next to it. Asia, a growing situation. Latin America, what should have been the role model, Brazil, with so much corruption now coming out. What happened in Venezuela with Chavez. Europe, will Greece stay in the euro? Will the EU gradually dilute what will happen in this country when there will be a referendum on the EU? Troubling times, Steve. So, I, I, had, I, ten, you, I, I had 10 good years as the envoy to the Prime Minister. Um, I wouldn't like to have a simple answer to you. I'm pleased I'm out of that role today. It's, it's a great tour de force of problems, and I wanted to, to, to bring us before I go to the audience, because to some degree, you, you've got a cast of really bad things reinforcing one another. And it's what's interesting when you think about you know, purpose-driven activity, be it in an organization or a nation, there seems to be a real deficit in people that are thinking about a ways to create cascading set of reinforcing positives, because the, because the problems are so so staggeringly large and the echo effects are so large that, that it, 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 you, you need something that begins to build on itself. And I was thinking there is a link to talking about purpose-driven uh, uh, work and purpose-driven firms and you know, the motivations of individuals, the motivations of firms uh, to make this because they create reinforcing echo effects. And I think the international system needs a bit of dose of this. At least that's my editorial comment uh, for today. But let me open up and comments from you. Shervin, did you want to say something, by the way? You are mine and mine of my personal heroes. Thank you. Yeah. You were scared. Um, just, I don't yeah, know this if is I can where the wine is useful. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a professor, so that means I'm a nerd, so I have uh, my notes on my hand, um, as most nerds do. 
I interviewed um, Elmo of Sesame Street the other day. I have my notes on my hand as well. <laughs> where, where are you a professor, sir? Which? Swarthmore College, mm -hmm. just outside of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's interesting to hear you list those countries because, you know, the great irony, of course, is that, and this would have been unimaginable just a few years ago, that Iran, of all those countries you mentioned, is probably the most stable outside of Morocco. And I think, actually, this speaks to what has been missed uh, in regards to the recent deal that uh, just happened. Um, I have a bit of a contrarian position on this because mm -hmm. I think it's really not about the bomb or Iran pursuing the bomb. I think that's been a bit overblown. I think the real story with Iran is uh, this notion that the society, the voting population, and there is actually a voting population, it turns out, in Iran of 18 million people who chose a very particular path, a path very different from mm -hmm. the previous path being laid out under Ahmadinejad. Um, and uh, I think this is actually the real story. And I think, I, I guess my question here is the, the Rouhani story. The Rouhani story, and actually the story in Iran is people would say to me, we don't want to become another Syria. Hmm. This was not really uh, advertised very much or reported much in the US. What do they mean by that? Sort of a demonstration to the Americans in particular, that this is a society that's keen on solving its own problems, right? Not having a beautiful lion destroy it. Um, in this case, the US, right? We would fix our own issues. To tie to the, the conversation or the theme of this particular talk, that's sort of the question I have for the crowd or for, uh, for you two gentlemen is, you know, in the work that I do and the work that so many people in this room do, it's about consciousness raising, about addressing and distributing uh, knowledge to an audience that's interested, that's curious, and perhaps doesn't know about particular parts of the world or particular mm -hmm. issues. But the great frustration I've found is, and lately I've become quite cynical on this issue, is where does consciousness raising ultimately end up? You get this sort of feeling, I see the fellow professor is nodding his head, right? You get the feeling that people perhaps feel happy that, or they feel sort of a content of having this knowledge, but perhaps also, and this is perhaps not admitted, uh, satisfaction that they're not living that particular life or in that, for example, let's say in Syria as I mentioned earlier. Thank God my life is not like the Syrian's life, right? Where does this consciousness raising end up ultimately in terms of action and outcomes and results? Other than the feeling of self-satisfaction that, oh, I'm a knowledgeable citizen of the world and I have an understanding of what's wrong in the world, but beyond that, what do I do? And so I encounter this daily, encounter this daily with my students who are very eager and earnest, but ultimately one wonders where it goes beyond the classroom. So that would be my question. Great, great question. So. And the combination of what I said before, of that pot of billions, and that intellectual force could be something that could dramatically change the dynamic if somehow there could be some dovetailing of that as opposed to pet projects that aren't going to really be life changers or world changers. And I think what you've just said provokes that as a solution that I think could actually be quite dramatic. Tying up that funding with the intellectual ability that is out there. Other questions, comments, right here in the aisle. And tell us who you are so we can buy you a drink later. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, um, yeah my name is uh, Suleiman. Um, Do you I'm mind so I can see you? Oh, Suleiman, sorry. stand in there. Sorry, thank you so much. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, thank you. Sorry, I've also got notes, sorry. Um, yeah, my, <laughs> my, my name is Suleiman. Just give us yeah. short form. Yeah, 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 no, of course, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm an architectural researcher, but a researcher, but also um, I'm Moonlight as a, as a journalist. So, um, yeah, I just... I, under I, your I, own name or someone else's? No, no, under my yeah, name, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, um, I guess I, I wonder if this public conversation about charity's role is sort of just a distraction from maybe, and this is going to make me sound like a radical socialist, I'm sorry, yeah. but um, I wonder if it's sort of just a distraction from the fact that we live in a kind of broken system that can't address things like poverty very well. I mean, I'm, in addition to being American, I'm, I'm also Afghan and, and in countries like Afghanistan that have been sort of destroyed and are being put back together, um, you are very exposed to the kind of raw structure and foundation of what makes a country. I mean, it's, it's sort of like being able to see the raw structure of a, of a building, you know. Um, and when you see a kind of a, a building completed, I mean, structural issues are concealed. And um, I mean, in Afghanistan, you see things like charity being a kind of palliative force uh, rather than a structurally constructive one. Um, so 
I mean, I, I wonder if that's the case here in the UK as well. I mean, T.S. Eliot complained in the lead up to World War II about the UK being centered on a belief system of compound interests and dividends. Um, mm -hmm. And I, perhaps much hasn't really changed and charity just ends, up being a, just ends up being a way to release the bottlenecks of a broken system rather than kind of healing it from within. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Very provocative, thoughtful Sorry. question. Thoughts? Well, look, I think um, Suleiman, charitable organizations in different countries do very different things. I don't believe that our country is a broken society. And I think charitable organizations, no matter what arena they are in, are a force for good within our society. I cannot address that in Afghanistan because I truly don't know. But when you have countries that have been broken by war, by strife, by internal tribal conflict, I would tend to think that the contribution from the charitable arena, almost by definition, is going to be peripheral and therefore very different. So that's the only way I can answer you. It's fascinating. I would just say, you know, thinking about this in short form, what you just said is that I think most countries in the world, ones and, and the ones that are really struggling, start out pretty in, in pretty crappy circumstances. Some may look better than others, as you described, but they're all pretty crappy. They all have some element of corruption, some element of misallocation of resources, some element of of a dominant class versus versus many others that are, you know, they, they push the ladder away. And I think you'll find that in every single society. The question is, when you then look at, the, you know, this the topic today of purpose-driven entities, there seems to be an inflection point of something beginning to change in some places to, to address that, where there's sort of an institutional self selflessness that exists with selfishness. You know, I asked a, a internet executive the other day uh, in the Bay Area in California, you know, uh, who, who's, who's an African-American guy who has an enormous, uh, he's, he's a billionaire now and worked with um, Y Combinator, how much soul and how much greed is involved in his decisions on what they fund. And he gave it very interesting. So I think that you find different sites, but when you go to Afghanistan, which, which you know, I think is, you know, badly in need of this, it's, it's still in the area where what, the inputs that are needed are so dramatic, but part of that has to come from an internal an internal commitment to make things different, but it's different. But we can talk at drinks about this. Daniel Levy, um, I, I want to go to you uh, before we close out because you are the living embodiment of pur purpose to me. Uh, you, you, nothing you do uh, is designed to really succeed financially uh, or in any other, but, but you are committed <laughs> to great causes. Uh, Can a few people try and persuade that to yeah. change? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, do you, you, I, I want to because this purpose-driven thing is I mean, you, you're 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 of a different generation, and one of the things I think what the Atlantic has reported a lot about is the changing nature of millennials. Mm -hmm. I should also mention to all of you that in October, I think it's 18th to the 20th, we in London, along with Bloomberg Philanthropies, Mike Bloomberg will be here, and the Aspen Institute, Walter Isaacson and Company are having a big organization called City Lab. This will be our third year. We had work Los Angeles. Now we're bringing it to London. Um, and part of the theme of it is this. It's the changing nature of millennials who are going to re-sculpt cities and the patterns and interactions, what community means, what they commit themselves to. And it's very much around the notion of purpose being brought into this. But I wanted to invite you because you you're committed to the, the kind of greater good in, in, in the many things you do. Good. I've tried to keep you from being so committed to some of those things and it failed. So, Daniel? You're still nice to me. Um, it's just a shame that we didn't have Tony Blair to tell his version of the swimming pool ambition <laughs> with compassion, because I think He's in next that, week. I think in that version, he hears the idea, stops, stands on the water, walks to the edge of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, don't tweet that, I was <laughs> facetious. So I, I kind of wanted to turn the tables on what you wanted me to do, Steve, because <clears throat> we have a relationship where, thankfully, I can get answers out of my dad when I pretty much want them, and I'm the only person who, when he puts his arm around you, I'm not expected to write <laughs> at the end of that conversation. 
Um, and, and when yeah, you're a net cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, when we, I, I wanted to kind of flip the question to you, Steve, in terms of your own motivation and, 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 and the purpose-driven path that you've um, trodden. Because when we first kind of started working together over a decade ago, um, you were trying to keep a particularly obnoxious individual from being appointed American ambassador to the UN, I believe. Yeah, someone said John Bolton and got it he right. He wrote about yeah. it. <laughs> So, uh, so I kind of wanted to, if it's okay, to flip the question and put it to you. And also, I kind of wanted to uh, express my pride that, um, uh, Dad, that you gave such a thorough dissing of, uh, of Goldberg's Atlantic uh, magazine cover story, which I'm sure you agreed with Steve, but you'd be too polite and collegial to say so. May I, may I respond to your son? Yeah. Um, I have to all the uh, time, so yeah, it's your uh, privilege. Yeah, I'll just say very quickly, um, on John Bolton, many of you, this is, this is a U.S. politics. When, when um, uh, George W. Bush beat John Kerry, now our Secretary of State fighting hard for an Iran deal, um, George Bush went to Brussels uh, in, in 2005, and he gave, gave a speech. It was a remarkable speech, uh, and almost no one paid attention. He said, we need to uh, turn around this feeling that America's a unilateralist, unilateralist nation, <laughs> And, and reset the button on working with other working with other countries, and it was one of the, it was if you were uh, in a, a principled internationalist and believed with working other nations world, it was a remarkably great speech. I wrote about that, and I gave George Bush a lot of praise on my blog. I, I received more hate mail uh, for that than I had received because people had already had four years. But I wrote an objective piece, and it was a week after that that George Bush nominated John Bolton. Uh, to serve as ambassador to the United Nations, and I decided, you know, this is, uh, we are in the U.S. a democracy, and I have a voice, and I'm tired of editors at the New York Times, whatever, so I was going to use my blog to do what Daniel Levy's been trying to do, but I was more successful uh, in trying to move the needle on something, and, and I decided to, to uh, uh, write every single day multiple articles on what it meant to be John Bolton in the world, and, and uh, and to do a high road distillation because people didn't know about him. And most of journalism, which was homogenized, lazy, dependent on press releases from places, was, and, and, and those, those writers who were willing to write about it weren't given latitude by editors to do so. They, they were in a situation where it was a boutique story. Joe Biden, who was one of my great heroes, he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, then called me up to lunch and said, John Bolton is an obscure bureaucrat going for a job no one cares about. You'll never get any traction. And of course, the Democrats had neither the House nor the Senate. So this is a, a, a point where a blog mattered, because John Bolton never did get confirmed. The vote never did happen, and he had to resign after the end of that congressional term. Uh, and, and I remind people it was Joseph Lieberman who actually helped me secure this. It was a long story, which I'll tell you over drinks, but Lieberman was the ending vote that, that, that nailed the coffin uh, in John. It was very ironic when you look at how history plays out. But at the time, you know, one thing I would say that, that I admire so much about Lord Levy and, and what I, whether he was a, movie, a, a music mogul, uh, and he was a music mogul, I saw all these music crowd at, at Daniel's wedding, and he you know, knows the entertainment industry uh, inside and knows the political set inside and out. But, but you meet people who understand how to animate forces and move things around. And if you're in a place like Washington, I don't know if it's true about London, but it's true in most long-term capitals, incumbent forces and incumbent groups become so stuck in place that it's very hard to dislodge those. It's very hard to turn a Labour Party around or to get it to, think get it to think differently. It's very hard to create what is the DNA of getting lots of people to understand that in volunteering matters that they can recreate community in places where everything we're doing with our digital selves is, is ripping our, self, our community apart. So I, I guess when I helped create New America Foundation and wrote this blog and these various things, the idea was I wanted to be the Silicon Valley disruptor the guy who rolled a bowling ball into incumbent structures and showed people that they could rip the throat out of classic journalism, which I was doing. I hated the Washington Post. They were, these were rip-off thieves. These were plagiarists. These were people that took material and information from us and wouldn't give us credit. So blogging to me at the time 
was a way to move the needle politically, but was also a way to shame the publishing industry that deserved to be shamed at the time. Uh, and, and I have no, no uh, uh, problem sort of calling it what it was, that we have a lot of corruption built in the system, and I believe so much in millennial change and coming along and keeping us on our toes. And that's what Daniel's been doing in the Middle East peace process, and you've been shining lights on you know, powerful people. So I guess in my view, when I think about purpose-driven entities, Part of what that means is having enough people that are willing to take willing to take both public and private risk. Risk is a very big part of change. And I guess just before we rack up the drinks, I, I'm interested in your thinking about risk because you've taken a lot of risks at various points in your both career and in your public life. But how do you know when the risk is the right one to take, uh, and when it's when it's because you can be recklessly risky and you can be constructively risk-taking. And I'm interested in how you evaluate risk. I think basically um, risk is an evaluation of what your worst downside can be. Hmm. When you come to a judgment of what your worst downside can be and you feel you can live with that worst downside, that you assess the potential of the upside of the risk you're taking and you feel the worst downside is livable with but the upside whether it's commercial whether it's your life whether it's for society can be so positive that's when it's a risk worth taking worth taking i think that's a great point to start i want to thank Steelcase one for this fantastic venue yeah, and for yeah. hosting us this evening. Um, I also want to say, um, I think we're having a reception upstairs. We've got lots of time. That, that Lord Levy changed his travel schedule. He's going off uh, uh, with his wife to Sardinia tomorrow, and they were going to be in a different place this evening. How grateful I am that you shared a bit of your life, and I was able to roll out your illustrious and fascinating career and and you know what we say we have a sister publication called courts some of you may see it at qz.com it's a sort of online digital only web publication and courts organize its reporting around obsessions and i've been fascinated to explore your obsessions and they, they've given us a lot of insights so lord levy godfather thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>